Hello there, Kyle Katarn here, and it is Wednesday, my dudes. Let's do the comic breakdown. First up, we've got Darth Vader Annual Number 2, Technological Terror by Chuck Wendig and Leonard Kirk. The comic opens with Tarkin arriving on Scarif, which is awesome because it's such a great location from Rogue One. Darth Vader name drops Project Stardust, and the Rogue One references just keep on coming. Tarkin is flanked by Death Troopers, director Orson Krennic shows up, and he even drops a prequel meme. It was really cool seeing Krennic and Vader work together. Um, when Krennic sees Vader using the Force to deflect the falling debris, um, it really explains why he's so uneasy around Vader in Rogue One. He's seen what he's capable of. Krennic tries to pin the sabotage efforts on Tarkin, as he tends to do, and Vader's not buying it. It was really cool getting to see Vader wandering around the Petronaki Arena from Attack of the Clones, reminiscing on the big fights on Padme and the start of the Clone Wars. It really drives home the thought that Darth Vader is lost in the past, just constantly suffering through the memories of Anakin Skywalker. We got a brief cameo from loyalty officer Udra, who trains Sinjir in Aftermath. It makes sense since Aftermath was also written by Chuck Wendig. Also mentioned is the Viper's Nest, an ISB training academy where Sinjir discovers a plot to assassinate Darth Vader during Aftermath. The panel of Vader standing in Galen Erso's office was really creepy, I really liked the artwork there. And Vader discovering the Kyber Crystals was a really cool moment as well. And then when he returns to report back to Krennic, Krennic is playing with a model of the Death Star. When I saw that, I laughed out loud. This fucking guy. The artwork was totally solid in this issue, especially when Vader and the Death Troopers wipe out the Geonosians. Visually, it just looks stunning. Darth Vader makes probably the most overt reference to Attack of the Clones in an issue already full of them. And I really like that his understanding of Kyber Crystals is what allowed him to fully understand what the weapon was and that it was a planet killer and not just some huge space station. Vader tries to warn Tarkin about relying too much on his technological terror, and Tarkin doesn't listen. We all know how well that turned out for him. The issue ends with Lyra Erso being approached by a random droid that has a message about the Death Star, what it really is, and what it's capable of, prompting her to go find her family and try and escape, probably to La Mu, where we see them in the beginning of Rogue One. Overall, this was a really good issue. Um, I read the Aftermath trilogy, and I wasn't a huge fan of Chuck Wendig's writing style, but there were no issues whatsoever in this comic, so great job, guys. Next up, we have Star Wars issue 51, Hope Dies, Part 2, by Kieran Gillen and Salvador LaRocca. The issue begins with Queen Trios attempting to flee the station, and we got an awesome parallel with the beginning of A New Hope, with the Shutoran warriors lining up alongside the corridor waiting for the airlock to breach, just like the Rebel soldiers on the Tantive IV. I thought it was a nice little turnaround that it's the Rebels that come storming through this time. Leia manages to chase down Queen Trios, but not before she's able to get into an escape pod. Han and Chewie arrive late for the commencement ceremony, and end up watching a different kind of show. We get some pretty awesome Millennium Falcon action as uh, Han tries to engage the entire fleet, buy time for the Rebels to get their bay doors open so they can launch some fighters of their own. Just when it seems like they have a chance, Darth Vader jumps into the fray with an awesome panel of the TIE Advanced X-1's targeting computer lighting up an outline of the Falcon. That's a hell of a cliffhanger. I can't wait for the next issue. The story's been a really fun ride so far. And lastly, we have Poe Dameron issue 29 by Charles Soule and Angel Anzueta. Poe is watching a flight log of Jessica Pava recovered from deep space, not knowing whether Black Squadron is alive or dead. It's revealed that Black Squadron was sent off to find more allies for the Resistance following the destruction of Starkiller Base. They arrive on Pastoria, which is a very unique looking planet, largely populated by the grasshoppers from A Bug's Life. In order to gain the favor of the King, Black Squadron agrees to fly escort for one of the Pastorian ships, which are really cool and kind of look like dragonflies. Suddenly, they encounter another group of Pastorian ships, and Black Squadron is easily able to fend off the attack. But when the ships they were escorting start shooting down an unarmed transport, Black Squadron realizes they may not be on the right side. It turns out they shot down the rightful claimant to the throne, and solidified the king they were helping in his position of power so that he could negotiate with the First Order when they arrived. He betrayed them. He had no plans of joining the Resistance. Understandably pissed off, Black Squadron sets off in search of new allies. The quest goes on. That's it for the comics this week. Thanks for watching, everybody. Check out the rest of my channel for more content, reactions, and reviews. Leave me a comment if you have a question or something to say, and as always, may the Force be with you.